Now I'd like to introduce our featured presenters today, Dr. Lou Halimek and Dr. Nicole Yamada. Dr. Halimek is a professor in the Division of Neonatal and Developmental Medicine in the Department of Pediatrics at Stanford Medicine and is the Director of Neonatal Resuscitation at Packard Children's Hospital. Dr. Halimek is the founding director of the Center for Advanced Pediatric and Perinatal Education and the world's first center dedicated to fetal, neonatal, pediatric, and obstetric simulation-based training and research. He is a former member of the Board of Directors of the International Pediatric Simulation Society, the inaugural Board of Directors of the Society for Simulation and Healthcare, and the inaugural Editorial Board of Simulation and Healthcare. His career in simulation-based training and research began in 1995, and over the past two decades, he has refined a method of debriefing based on his collaboration with colleagues in aerospace, aviation, and the military. This objective professional approach to debriefing has been adopted as a standard for the neonatal resuscitation program of the American Academy of Pediatrics, its 25,000 instructors, and 3.3 million trainees. Dr. Yamada is a clinical assistant professor in the Division of Neonatal and Developmental Medicine in the Department of Pediatrics at Stanford Medicine and is an attending neonatologist in the intensive care unit at Packard Children's Hospital. Dr. Yamada is the associate director of the Center for Advanced Pediatric and Perinatal Education. She is an expert in debriefing teams of healthcare professionals from all areas of clinical care and of all levels of experience. And she has worked with teams from both academic and private hospitals all over the US, as well as teams from around the world. And she has been invited to deliver simulation instructor programs in Moscow and Hong Kong. And with that, let's turn it over to Dr. Halimek and Dr. Yamada. Thank you, Jackie, for those kind introductions. Um, I'd like to emphasize the fact that both uh, Dr. Yamada and I are practicing neonatologists. So we look at debriefing from the vantage point of healthcare professionals who are leading teams of people in the care of critically ill patients. Um, I do want to acknowledge that our training and debriefing strategies, as you mentioned, have been heavily influenced by uh, colleagues in other industries who are outside of healthcare and where the, in those industries, the expectations for both human performance are high as well as the risk to human life is high. And I'd especially like to say thanks to people that we've known over the years, both at NASA and the FAA for whom, from whom we've learned so much. Um, I'd also like to point out that while our discussion today is really focused on healthcare debriefing, um, the strategies that we're going to highlight over the course of the next 40 minutes or so can be applied when debriefing any type of situation. And that's going to be especially important for our audience uh, today because we, rec we saw that approximately half of you are actually working in industries outside of healthcare. Okay, so let's get started. The learning objectives, as many of you are aware from when you signed up for the webinar, are these listed here. Um, and they're really specifically related to um, our selection of uh, wanting to discuss uh, the really foundational strategies that we think are um, instrumental to running an effective debriefing. The outline for our webinar is first we'll just start with what is debriefing, a brief definition there so that we're all on the same page about um, what we're talking about today. And then we'll first cover some guiding principles about how we generally think about debriefings and our approach to debriefings um, in any situation. And then finally, we'll roll into a discussion of four specific uh, key strategies with video examples of um, things that we specifically implement through um, all of our debriefings. And I think it's worth mentioning that these are only just four strategies out of a total of 20. Um, we cover all 20 in our online debriefing program, which you'll hear about later at the end of this webinar. Um, but these aren't all of this, the solutions to running an effective debriefing. We just wanted to cover what we think is really instrumental and foundational um, during this discussion. So the first question that I think is worth answering is what is a debriefing? Um, and so for those of you who may not be familiar with what debriefings are, we really wanted to make sure that we're all on the same page about what we're discussing here today. So a debriefing at a very basic level is an interactive discussion of a prior series of events and can be facilitated in a number of different ways and to a, a different levels of involvement from the debriefer. And oftentimes that depends on the experience level of those people being debriefed. So people who may have a lot of experience um, with debriefings may be able to even start to conduct their own self debriefings as a, as a team. Whereas other people who may be less familiar with the uh, 
role and the um, function of a debriefing may need a little bit more facilitation from a trained debriefer or someone with experience with debriefing. The next question is what is a good debriefing? So now we know what a debriefing is, but how do you make it, how do you make a good debriefing? A good debriefing is one that is constructive, concise, and identifies both strengths and weaknesses. And oftentimes, especially those of us coming from an environment where we're training other people or we're educators, we often focus on what people need to learn or what they might need to improve on. Um, and one of the things that we really wanna emphasize is that the, a good debriefing is an opportunity to talk about both strengths and weaknesses and helping those that are being debriefed understand um, what facilitated their ability to perform really well if they had a really strong performance um, and how to replicate that performance again in the future. Um, and also then taking the opportunity to address weaknesses um, and not only identifying them, but coming up with strategies to help those people who are being debriefed um, learn how to avoid those uh, same challenges or those same weaknesses again in the future. So I'll let Lou talk about some of the guiding principles that we have for debriefing. So we'll go ahead and review those now. The first guiding principle is that instructors should always maintain a professional business-like matter of fact tone, whether training performance was exemplary or highly flawed. Uh, our overall goal is to enable the people being debriefed to eventually be able to debrief themselves. Uh, we want them to be able to do this without the need for a trained debriefer. Certainly in healthcare, it's not always going to be possible if we're debriefing real life situations to have a trained debriefer present. And so we want to allow them opportunity to practice this and we want to draw as much information from them and self critique as we can uh, during that debriefing. Uh, that ability to assess their own performance becomes extremely important, especially when we're working in the real environment. Second guiding principle, the role of the instructor in a debriefing is to facilitate rather than dominate discussion among trainees. Um, when I lead a debriefing, my expectation is those being debriefed will actually do most of the talking and I can be relatively quiet. Now that doesn't mean that if a team does not recognize a performance gap that I'm not going to eventually intervene, but I will intervene only after I've tried uh, as much as I possibly can to draw that information, draw that self critique out from them. Debriefing should be focused on the actions of the individual trainees, how those actions contributed to the performance of the team, how team performance influenced patient outcome. Uh, that is absolutely critical. We have to get to what happened to the patient and how the actions of the team actually led to that. Uh, in the end, what we want is we want the people being debriefed to develop strategies for replicating those actions that uh, result in good care of the patient, in other words, successful human and system performance, but also to avoid actions uh, that are ineffective or harmful. So we re again, we really want them to uh, be able to reflect and develop these strategies themselves. And there should always be, in any healthcare debriefing, uh, a discussion of what happened to the patient. And this is a real key point. Uh, technical performance debriefings, which is what Dr. Yamada and I do, uh, these are different than critical incident stress debriefings. These two types of debriefings have different objectives and no attempt should ever be made to try to conduct them simultaneously. And a technical performance debriefing is not therapy. Technical performance debriefings and critical incident stress deb debriefings are often confused in healthcare. That's been our experience. And the way to distinguish these two is that a technical performance debriefing is focused ultimately on what affected the care of the patient and how the patient did. Whereas a critical incident stress debriefing is focused on the emotional health of those who are caring for the patient. Now, both of those are very important. Both of them have their place, but again, they have very distinct and very different objectives. And so don't confuse those two when you are debriefing. Okay, so we'll roll into now our discussion of these four key strategies that we really wanted to dig into today. Um, and again, these are just four of 20. Um, but what we'll, what we'll do for the um, next portion of the webinar is actually introduce each strategy followed by a video clip from a debriefing 
showing that strategy being implemented by a debriefer. And then we'll have a little discussion afterwards about really why we feel that those strategies are important and what we're hoping to achieve with, with each, each of those. Um, just a comment on the clips that you'll see. These were taken from debriefings that were recorded to illustrate specific points. Um, so while the actors uh, in these debriefings were asked to portray specific roles for both the scenarios in which they performed and then the subsequent debriefings, they're all practicing healthcare professionals. Um, but the debriefer himself was not scripted and really implemented these strategies as they would be in any debriefing. The first strategy, again, is one that I think applies to all debriefings, and it's really just how to prepare learners or people being debriefed to participate in that debriefing. Um, and we uh, want to show how you can clearly communicate expectations um, at the very beginning of a debriefing. So in this clip, it's the first 40 seconds of the first uh, debriefing with this group of uh, people being debriefed and the debriefer who's starting to lead that discussion anyone else's performance outside of this space. The conversation certainly is open to everyone. So even if you weren't playing a role in that particular phase of the, the scenario, please feel free to chime in with any observations uh, or thoughts you may have. Be open to learning, especially be open to learning from our mistakes. Um, be able to accept uh, any critique, both gratefully and gracefully. And then finally, we have a lot of potential things that we could discuss, or a lot of things that we could potentially discuss, uh, but we won't have time to do, go through all those today, so we'll try to hit the major points. Okay. So Dr. Lamek, what are your goals as the debriefer when you make these types of statements at the beginning of a debriefing? Well, I think as you could see in here in that particular video segment, uh, I have some very specific goals, things I wanna communicate uh, at the beginning of every debriefing. Uh, when I'm first meeting this group. Um, first of all, I want to ensure that uh, absolute confidentiality is going to be maintained um, during uh, any sort of scenario, whether it's a simulated scenario or a real scenario. Uh, you may see weaknesses become manifest, and so those are things that we want to uh, keep confidential within the group that's being debriefed. Uh, we want to ensure that there is psychological safety, meaning that actually people feel safe and comfortable talking about their mistakes uh, within the group that's uh, assembled. Uh, I would like to see active participation from all members of the group, although I don't mandate it. I know that some people actually are quiet uh, by nature, and as long as it appears that they are mentally engaged and are learning, I don't push people to talk, but I certainly would like to see that. Um, I really want people to be open to learning from mistakes. If we are running simulated uh, scenarios uh, in general, those are about making mistakes and learning from those. So that's a real key expectation that we set up front. Um, and what I talked about at the very end, that everyone will accept critique. And remember, critique is not criticism, but that everyone will accept critique both gratefully and gracefully. And I have to thank, uh, uh, my colleague and friend at Johnson Space Center, uh, Mike Sterling, for that, because that is uh, sort of the mantra that they live by when they debrief uh, astronaut crews and flight controllers. And then finally, especially if you are working in the real environment um, where you, you, know, you don't have a lot of time to debrief after a real event has occurred with patient care, because the teams have to go back and take care of other patients in that unit. Um, so for us, when we're debriefing issues within the ICU or within labor and delivery, then we definitely need to make sure that people understand we only have a few minutes for this debriefing, therefore we're gonna cover the most important, what we think are the most important topics and then we're going to move on. And is that something that you cover at the beginning of every debriefing? Well, it, it depends. Uh, if it's the first time I'm meeting a group and certainly I'll talk about those things, I wanna make sure that my expectations are clear to them uh, and they know that this is gonna be an environment in which they can freely talk about their mistakes and learn from them. Uh, on the other hand, if we're running a training program or maybe we're running four or five scenarios uh, over the course of the morning or the day, uh, then I won't repeat those every time, as long as I'm sure that people under understood them, heard them the first time. Okay. All right. And so then moving into actually initiating the debriefing itself, um, one of the things that we always talk about in, when we talk about how to really run an effective debriefing is starting with this question, what happened in 10 words or less? And so this next clip will show this first question being asked by the debriefer and then the initial responses given by the people being debriefed. To start off, uh, what happened in that scenario in 10 words or less? 
short-term neonate umbilical cord rupture, needed blood. Okay. I would say term neonate, um, hypoxic, hypovolemic, full resuscitation. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Any other additional input? I think that included everything. Okay. Yes. Many debriefers in healthcare have been taught to or even prefer to start their debriefings with a question along the lines of how did that go or how did that feel? And the question here asked was what happened in Ted Burns or less? Why do you start debriefings that way? Um, well, th that particular question, um, you know, how did that go? Uh, for those of us who use video, um, it, it oftentimes is hard to, to know exactly how that went, mm -hmm. what happened before you've watched the video and had a chance to actually assess performance. So we try to avoid, uh, if we're going to be using video, whether it's a real life scenario that we're playing video back uh, for, or it's a simulated scenario, we try to avoid getting into the debriefing too much with uh, an assessment just based solely on memory. Mm -hmm. Uh, we'd rather watch the video and critique it in real time. Um, so we avoid that question. And we also avoid the question is in terms of how did you feel about that? Um, I know that's very commonly used and people are free to choose however they would like to start their debriefing. But um, I've not heard that question asked in other high risk industries that do debriefing. Um, I think that it can set the debriefing up to be confused with the uh, critical incident stress debriefing, which again, as we talked about earlier, critical incident stress debriefings and technical performance debriefings are two very different things. And what we're really talking about here today are technical performance debriefings. Mm -hmm. And so I try to avoid those kinds of questions because they can be rather subjective and at times rather vague. So by saying what happened in 10 words or less, we try to accomplish a couple of very important things. First of all, um, we, we try really hard to set up professional business like matter of fact tone for the debriefing. Um, we want people to know that, you know, again, saving lives is our business. That tone is extremely important uh, for the debriefing. And we don't want to waste anybody's time uh, with superfluous conversation, especially if we have very limited time to cover important topics in patient care. And so that's the first thing that it does. The second thing that it does is it does encourage people to be concise and precise in their use of language. Uh, and as we discussed, uh, uh, I've mentioned several times now, that especially when debriefing in the real environment, where time pressure is quite intense, and we have, after we've taken care of one patient and we debrief that, we have other patients that are waiting for our care. Right. So we don't have the luxury of, of lots and lots of time for, to debrief a real situation. Now, we may have that luxury if we're debriefing simulated situations in a training program, uh, but even there, we don't want to waste time. Uh, our, my experience over the last two plus decades in using simulation healthcare is that what teams really want is they want to get in as many scenarios as they possibly can. So if we are being redundant in our debriefing, if at least they're perceiving that perhaps we're not covering any new material during the debriefing, we're discussing things that aren't terribly important, uh, then they start to get antsy and they would much prefer to uh, be in another scenario and see what more they can learn rather than continuing to talk about things that perhaps aren't as relevant as they should be. Okay. Uh, the what happened in 10 words or less is a very specific question too. Um, sometimes uh, another strategy that I've seen debriefers use is asking the questions what went well and what didn't go well mm -hmm. in that scenario and starting out a debriefing that way. Can you comment on how that strategy compares to using what happened in 10 words or less? Again, a lot of these things are personal preference. Mm -hmm. um, uh, sometimes in the real environment, when, when time pressure is intense, uh, I'll see people say, well, what went well? They typically start out with what went well, then they get to, well, what didn't go so well? Um, the only issue about that is that, um, it, for example, let's say we determine that you and I are working on a patient and something did not go well. Mm -hmm. We say, okay, uh, the intubation of that patient did not go well. Mm -hmm. um, if we don't then drill down, if we don't get to the underlying causes of why that intubation did not go well, and it could be something like a deficit in content knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't know what size endotracheal tube to use. We didn't know how to properly handle the laryngoscope. It could be a problem with decision making. Uh, we didn't um, uh, make the right decision. We decided to intubate too soon or we decided to intubate too late. 
It could be that our te actual technical skill, our hand-eye coordination of the way they, we handled the laryngoscope in the endotracheal tube wasn't appropriate and didn't allow us to be successful. Or it could involve a host of behavioral skills around communication. Maybe we didn't effectively ask for the right size equipment. Uh, maybe the ambient noise level in the room was too high and we weren't able to hear one another. All of those kinds of things and all of those skill sets can actually influence why something did not go well or why it went very well. Right. And those end up being the critically important aspects of what happened that you want to cover during a debriefing. So if you just stay at the very superficial level of, mm -hmm. you know, tell me three things that went well and three things that didn't go well. Again, if you have very limited time, you have only a few minutes to carry out a debriefing, that gets people thinking about those particular aspects, but it doesn't drill down to the underlying root causes. And that's mm -hmm. a, something that you really need to be able to get to at some point uh, during a debriefing. So your hope with the what happened in 10 words or less is just the beginning and then really the rest of the debriefing is to discuss a lot of those other issues more in specific terms. That, that's yeah. correct, yes. Okay. okay, so moving on to the next strategy. This is titled Avoiding Qualitative Statements and it really describes um, our goal of trying to draw performance assessment from the learners or from the people being debriefed. Um, and then just to give the audience some background on the clip that's being used here, this is taken from a debriefing of the care of a premature infant who is in respiratory failure and in need of CPR. Um, and at this point, the group is discussing the team's uh, decision of whether to intubate the patient uh, prior to the initiation of, start of chest compressions. And we will see that the trainees or the people being debriefed address a question directly to the debriefer. And what I want to point your attention to is how the debriefer responds and the discussion that follows from the trainees. What do you think? Is it difficult to intubate while someone's doing compressions? Have you ever done that? Let's, let's see if we have any consensus among the group. So the choices are to not do compressions and intubate, focus on the intubation. Because it was mentioned that sometimes it can be difficult to intubate while the chest is moving, especially in a very small patient. Um, another choice is to start compressions and hold off on intubation, perhaps do bag mask. Another choice is to do both simultaneously. Do we have any consensus among this team about what should be done right now with a heart rate of 26, four minutes, roughly a little over four minutes in, of age? I think if the intubator is comfortable, you should start with chest compressions and intubation at the same time. Okay. But if it's starting to interfere, then you should hold off on the chest compressions because the intubation is most important and only takes a brief moment. Okay. And it does take a while for you to build up um, enough blood flow to have appropriate cerebral perfusion pressure. Okay. okay, so backup team comes into the room and the backup physician is immediately given an order to intubate. So watch what happens from this point. And okay. Uh, so in this clip, we demonstrated this concept of avoiding qualitative statements. What does that mean? Concretely, it means to avoid the use of adjectives and adverbs. And the way, if you are leading the debriefing and the way you're speaking with the team and, and avoiding providing any sort of qualitative assessment of their performance. You know, we've talked about several times already in the course of our discussion here today that it's really important for members of these teams to be able to look at their performance, reflect on their performance, and come up with their own assessment. Um, it's not going to be possible to have a trained debriefer available to run through the hospital 24 hours a day to be present for every debriefing that should be taking place. And so we need our teams to be able to do this. Um, um, I think it's a professionalism issue. I think it's an issue of, quite honestly, delivering optimal patient care. So they have to be able to reflect on their own performance um, and decide whether that performance was optimal or not. If it wasn't optimal, okay, what are the weaknesses? Let's identify those weaknesses and let's begin to discuss strategies for making sure those weaknesses don't become manifest in the future. Um, similarly, if it was, if the team performed at a very high level, if, if their performance was deemed to be optimal under the circumstances, uh, they really need to understand what it was, what it was that enabled them to perform at such a high level. Mm -hmm. Because it's, it's one thing to 
do a really good job at something. It's another thing to understand how to replicate that good job in the future. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just about weaknesses. It's not just about good performance. It's actually about understanding the underlying uh, uh, causes or the, um, uh, the, the abilities that are the circumstances that actually allow teams to perform uh, along that uh, performance spectrum. Mm -hmm. But in this situation, um, one of the people be being debriefed actually asked you a question directly. Um, and you're an experienced neonatologist with expertise in neonatal resuscitation, and you probably had an opinion in this case of whether or not the team did the correct thing or the best thing for this patient. Um, but instead you responded with, let's see if we have any consensus from the group. Why did you avoid answering that question? Well, I, I could have easily answered that question. Mm -hmm. um, and they, that team was turning to me as uh, the person to answer the question and tell them how they did. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see that as the role of the debriefer. Again, unless there is a problem that, that they are unable to recognize a gap in performance where you might need to step in and help them recognize that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you really want to draw that answer out from them. You want mm -hmm. them to uh, assess their own performance as best they possibly can. Um, we uh, typically debrief experienced healthcare professionals that the team that uh, was seen in that video was a, obviously a team of experienced healthcare professionals. More than likely, there's at least one, if not more people in the room who know the answer to that question already. Mm -hmm. uh, at least they have their own answer formulated. And what can happen is if I tell them immediately what I think should have been done, I potentially can shut down discussion. Because mm -hmm. they're going to say, oh, the debriefer or Dr. Halamic just said this is what should be done. I was thinking maybe something different should be done. But if that's what he says, then that's what we should go with. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to make the supposition that since I wasn't in the scenario that I know exactly what it is they were seeing, what it is they were hearing and go ahead and tell them what should have been done because they may have an alternative strategy that's just as effective or perhaps even more effective than what I might be talking about. And so I never want to shut down that kind of discussion. I want to give it time to, to come up to the surface mm -hmm. uh, because oftentimes the people that are being debriefed have, they come up with some very unique and very valuable solutions to these kinds of problems. And I'd rather hear from them first. Uh, again, that doesn't mean that if at the end of a, a discussion and uh, after multiple attempts to try to draw what I feel would be the best answer out from them, if they fail to recognize, especially a weakness, um, then we do need to intervene. We do need to call attention to that and tell them the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. We don't want them to leave that space thinking that, you know, knowing that, or you know that they did something that potentially could harm the patient. Right. You don't want them leaving that space thinking that uh, uh, that was the right thing to do because that will lead to real patient harm. Mm -hmm. So you can't let that happen. But in mm -hmm. general, especially with experienced healthcare professionals, there's someone you can draw the answer from. It's mm -hmm. much more powerful if it comes from them rather than it comes from you to them. Yeah. So we're talking a lot about drawing assessment of performance from the people being debriefed. But the, the other thing that this uh, strategy was related to was avoiding qualitative statements. Can you give us an example of what that really means? Um, sure, this is, this is one I use all the time whenever mm -hmm. I talk about this. Um, if I have two teams uh, with me and team one uh, is coming out from a scenario for a debriefing and I look at them and I say, at some point during that debriefing as I'm conversing with them, oh, you guys did a great job. And then team two comes out and they come out for their debriefing and somewhere in that conversation I say, oh, you guys did a good job. What ends up happening is even though both teams performed at an adequate level, mm -hmm. the team that heard the word great now is thinking that their performance was much, much better than the team that heard the word good. Mm -hmm. And so those are two perfectly acceptable adjectives. They both indicate you know, good performance, uh, adequate performance. But yet I set up a dynamic here where that I probably didn't want to set up. There's, a, there's enough uh, difficulty sometimes in debriefings, especially with different groups of people uh that they're reading a lot into it anyway so my preference is to not add to that uh mm -hmm. not make it more difficult for them to discern uh i don't want them to just try to discern for me what their performance is like um but i'd rather have it come from them mm -hmm. uh, and and bubble up from them because again they're going to remember it much better mm -hmm. um and uh, I think be able to translate whatever it is we talk about into their practice uh if it comes from them mm -hmm. rather than sort of in the grade school teacher yeah. type, teacher student type of role where I'm the source of all knowledge. They don't know much of anything. Every time that they have a question, they ask me, I answer. Um, again, we're, we're with healthcare professionals who are adults, who are intelligent people, experienced people. 
most of the time they know the answers already. Yeah. Yeah. And I can imagine how that also helps to, uh, and I've seen how that helps to avoid creating defensiveness in debriefings too, because you're really asking for their own assessment of their performance and they're not looking to the debriefer for um, some validation or some feedback. Um, the next strategy also talks more about de defensiveness and really how to deconstruct defensiveness and try to minimize defensiveness. And that's limiting the use of second person pronouns. Um, so in this clip, um, this is a debriefing separate from the, the one that we just watched. Uh, this is the resuscitation of a full term infant who is in cardiac arrest. Um, and the team in this scenario struggled to provide timely care. And so by this point in the debriefing, um, it's already been established that several steps of the resuscitation were delayed relative to the standard of care. And so because of that, multiple members of the team are unhappy with their performance. Um, so let's watch this clip to see how the debriefer, debriefer handles this um, challenging situation. So in terms of the ergonomics at the bedside, the crowding at the bedside, is there anything that could be done? about that? Anything that could have been done about that? Well, the patient could have been bagged from the side that I'm on now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that would have That's freed true. up space. Okay. And what could have led to that not happening in this scenario? I think not just not being aware that um, there wasn't an, enough room for her to really get in there and see mm -hmm. what okay. she needed what, to see. What led to that lack of awareness? I guess me not saying anything. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what prevent what could prevent an individual in a situation like this from speaking up about they don't have enough room? They're so focused on that task. Okay. I think it's hard to do. It's hard for me to speak up sometimes. Why when, is it hard? Because I don't want to let the team down or I don't want people to think that I can't do something when mm -hmm. I can do it, mm -hmm. but the circumstances aren't exactly right. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's just really hard for me to verbalize. But the most important person is the patient and they're the ones that really needed the line. So that's true. I feel like we have to find a way to get over that and to get over, mm -hmm. you know, and to be okay with switching roles and saying, I can't get this done right now. And are, are there any, anything else that any other member of this team could have done to determine that the inter, that intravascular access was not yet secured? I think the team leaders could have checked in okay. earlier. Team leader could have inquired about that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody else on the team could have inquired about that, right? Mm -hmm. I think I definitely <clears throat> could have because when you're doing ventilations and compressions, it's hard to do anything else. Yeah. Okay. But I, I wasn't doing either. Mm -hmm. So I could have checked and saw okay. what the status of the fluids in the line placement was. Okay, so a number of things could have been done differently to perhaps avoid that situation. Mm -hmm. Okay. So one of the things I noticed in that clip is that you could even tell from the, the body language of some of the people being debriefed that they were really unhappy and really defensive. And in general, debriefing professionals, practicing healthcare professionals, or people even outside of healthcare who might be experts in their field and have experienced a, a difficult situation or one in which they made mistakes can be really challenging. Um, people are, can often be defensive in those, in those situations when they're talking about their performance and they're examining their performance. And then even in this type of situation where you might have video of what they've done um, to, to show them back. Um, so how do you approach those types of situations? Well, I think the reason you're concerned about defensiveness is because defensiveness can impair learning. Mm -hmm. And the debriefing is all about learning again, learning strengths, learning weaknesses, how to replicate the good things and avoid the bad things in the future. Uh, but it's also important to remember what we talked about very early on, which was that a technical performance debriefing is not a critical incident stress debriefing. Mm -hmm. um, when I've seen debriefings take place in other high-risk industries, the debriefings really are not about um, uh, making people feel better. They're about making people be better, mm -hmm. helping to perform at a higher level. And so in an instance like that where the team did not perform, at least in that phase of the patient care, the team did not perform at an optimal level, it doesn't surprise me that they're unhappy. In fact, I would expect that they would be unhappy. Mm -hmm. And I would be much more concerned if they were happy with poor performance. Mm -hmm. That tells me that we've got some actually significant issues in either 
the seriousness with which they're taking their participation in that particular scenario, or they just don't understand uh, in general uh, how important it is to uh, be able to uncover the root causes of weaknesses that become manifest. Um, one of the things we did see in that clip is that, um, uh, going back to some of our prior discussion, uh, the team did not stay at a very superficial level. Okay, yes, the line did not go in in a timely manner. Uh, what we were able to do in the course of that debriefing is actually drill down to the underlying root causes, and there were actually a number of those that were uh, uh, elicited from the people being debriefed. So um, that's really what you want to be able to get out of the debriefing. Um, Personally, I think that if you maintain a professional business-like matter-of-fact approach when you're debriefing, again, you're not really excited and happy when the team performs well, you're not really sort of down and depressed when the team's not performing well, and they're not reading your either, they're not hear, using your words or using your nonverbal communication to assess their performance, but rather they're thinking through it critically. Uh, and then you allow, you lead them through a discussion that allows them to uncover the underlying root causes and come up with strategies to overcome those, I think that's where we get to the point where actually we're going to have teams that are, again, performing uh, in a, or executing in a flawless manner. Mm -hmm. doesn't mean that they're perfect, but it means that when things don't go well, they're able to uh, um, enable contingency plans mm -hmm. um, and enact those and flawlessly execute those. Mm -hmm. um, and in this clip, getting back to this particular strategy, you really avoided um, in a specific, it seemed very intentional um, using the second person pronouns like you mm -hmm. or you guys or even addressing um, any of the people in that debriefing by name. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us how that strategy helps to minimize defensiveness during a debriefing? Sure. I think when you avoid the use of the, the second person pronoun you, uh, the people being debriefed can be much more objective about their performance. Um, Either if they're talking about themselves or talking about uh, their colleagues, um, because you're not putting them on the spot. You're talking about uh, the physician in that particular uh, event, for example, rather than Dr. Yamada or Nicole. Mm -hmm. um, and I've seen that repeatedly, and that's actually something we brought in from, we, we've learned from watching military debriefings. Um, it's especially important when performance is suboptimal. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes groups themselves will use second person pronouns, first person pronouns, that's fine if they're comfortable with that. But as a debriefer, I try to avoid that as much as possible. Um, for example, I would never ask an individual in a debriefing, why did you do that? Because mm -hmm. that really puts them on the spot. Yeah. If they're not defensive already, they're going to become defensive. Instead, I would ask the team, you know, if it's, if, if it's about the physician, for example, I'd say, what did the physician leading that resuscitation just do? And once we do that, and I'm referring to the, the physician in the third person rather than by name, actually it makes it much easier for that physician to talk about his or her personal actions and whether they were good or bad for the patient. Um, it also enables the people, other people being debriefed who may not usually be in a position where they're offering critique to a physician or to someone who is more senior than they are, and they can talk about that position in the third person and it makes it easier for them to offer their own observations about that individual's performance. So um, the, the key is to try to encourage discussion, encourage self-reflection, uh, avoid defensiveness because that tends to inhibit those things. Um, but then follow it up with a series of questions where you actually begin to drill down to the root causes. So as, as we've said several times now in the course of this webinar, the overall goal is to be able to train these teams so they can debrief themselves, uh, whether they be debriefing simulated events or real events, uh, because ultimately that's what's going to allow all of us collectively to enhance our performance. Mm -hmm. So we've talked a lot about these strategies in the context of taking care of patients or even in the context of running simulations. Can you um, comment a little bit about how you see these types of strategies and the things that, we've, that we do talk about in our online course being translated even outside of healthcare? Sure. Um, I think the ability to objectively uh, self-reflect and critique one's own performance, as well as to objectively and um, in a non-punitive way talk about colleagues' performance, mm -hmm. is what allows individuals and teams to overall perform at a high level. Mm -hmm. um, I've certainly seen that in industries outside of healthcare, uh, where either the lives of other individuals or the lives of the debriefees themselves are at stake. But I've even seen it in things like, uh, or in activities such as uh, athletics, um, 
where the best athletes tend to be the ones who, instead of falling apart or not recognizing uh, what their own weaknesses are, they're able to objectively assess uh, those weaknesses and then develop strategies, perhaps in concert with a coach, but develop strategies to overcome those weaknesses. Um, those are the athletes who can handle failure. This failure always comes to an athlete at some point, and they're the ones who are able to go beyond that and actually excel at what they do. Okay. All right, I think with that, we'll turn it back over to, um, to Jackie. Okay, so our first question is, how can these techniques be applied to scenarios outside of emergency care, for example, chronic inpatient care, or even outside of healthcare? Um, I've, in terms of outside of healthcare, I think one of the uh, best examples I can give actually involved very junior people. Um, I'm the faculty athletic fellow, a sort of a liaison between the women's uh, indoor volleyball team here at Stanford and the, the faculty. And uh, their coaching staff uh, uses these strategies extremely well. Um, you think of a coach as someone who's always telling somebody what to do. Uh, well, what I have uh, seen Coach Hamley do and his staff do exceedingly well is rather than always be telling the players what they should be doing or what they shouldn't be doing, um, in the huddle, it, before the game, before the match, uh, during the match, after the match, you'll ask them uh, for their assessment of their own performance and what, if anything, they need to do differently. And these are 18 to 22 year old young women who are very good at doing this. So they just won the national championship last year, in fact. Um, so when I see that kind of ability to self-reflect, analyze, and come up with strategies to perform at a higher level in an age group like that, I think that certainly that's something that all of us uh, throughout our lives should be able to do. Um, other high-risk industries do this quite well. In fact, they, they do it much better than we do in healthcare, quite honestly. They've been doing it for a long time. NASA's been doing this for 50 or 60 years. So in any sort of environment where individual and team performance is important, um, the ability of the individuals to self-reflect and the ability of the team to reflect, to put those self-reflections together to come up with an assessment of team performance. And again, look at what did we do well? How can we replicate those things in the future? And what did we not do very well? What weaknesses became manifest and what strategies can we collectively come up with so that we can avoid those things in the future? Um, it really applies across the board. Um, our next question is, um, the presenters indicated that working from a recording is far preferable to going from memory. Um, if they don't record the actual in the moment resuscitations to review um, at a later date, do you have any suggestions? Yeah, that's a common challenge that we hear about from people who are running debriefings. Um, and I think, you know, as as we tried to show in these um, debriefings, it is ideal to have that objective record uh, to reference to so that everybody can see both the, you know, the entire group of people being debriefed as well as the debriefer can really see that performance um, and share that understanding before really discussing that performance. Um, but oftentimes that may not be available for whatever reason, whether it's time or technology um, capabilities. And so I think just at least having some type of an objective record of what happened is the, is the goal of what you might want to start with. So even if it's not recorded, perhaps it's written. You could take, uh, you know, in, a, in an emergency situation, oftentimes people are recording the, on the code sheet the events that happened. Or if it's not an emergent situation, if it's um, another healthcare situation, or again, even outside of healthcare, just a record of what the series of events were and use that as the shared understanding of the team of really what actually happened. And then the goal of the debriefing is to dig down into why those events happened as they did and what the team might have been able to do differently. Um, or uh, again, if it was a good performance, what the team really did well in that situation and to try to replicate that. And I think it's really important for folks to understand that if there is no objective record of an individual and team performance, and if you are trying to reflect on your own performance as you were involved in that particular uh, event, um, one, especially if it's if you're trying to perform under intense time pressure, your ability to remember things while you are, you have perhaps a life at stake or some other serious issue, uh, and you're doing things uh, actively, it's often very difficult. Your memory may be impaired in terms of remembering exactly what you did and when you did it, how you did it. Uh, another thing that can happen is you can, if you are part of that event, you can lose objectivity. And so you may be either hypercritical or excessively critical of something that you did or your colleagues did. Um, 
or you may not be critical enough and you may think that you did a much better job than you actually did. So uh, we encourage people, especially if you are, if, if, we're, if, if, if it's possible to get video, um, it's really important to do that um, and use that because when you're debriefing, it really resolves a lot of questions about who did what, when, who said what, when, how did they do that. Uh, it gives everybody a, a very objective, very concrete uh, basis upon which to uh, uh, offer critique. Thank you. Um, we have had a few questions about um, the timing of debriefing. So do you have any guidelines or suggestions for a longer term retrospective debrief? So outside of an immediate setting, two weeks to a month or more? Um, and also, is there an extension of time um, that is considered appropriate for a debriefing? So if we're, if we're debriefing real life events, um, in general, you'd like to debrief those as close to the event as possible. Um, now you do have to sort some things out. I talked about the critical incident stress debriefing. Um, if it's a particularly traumatic event, like for us in our field, it could be the death of a patient. Um, there are some folks who are ready to debrief that right away because their whole focus is on what can we do differently to perhaps avoid that outcome in the future. And there are other folks who, from an emotional standpoint, are not ready to do that at that time. And so they may need a critical incident stress debriefing before they actually can participate effectively in a debriefing. But in general, I think that's, that's a smaller number of people. Um, so ideally, while memories are fresh, get everyone together, uh, debrief on that then. Um, sometimes it's not possible to spend much time doing that. And so uh, when it isn't possible, try to cover perhaps the most important one or two points. And again, not just very superficially, but try to drill down a bit on those and the underlying root causes. Uh, keep, ask people to create a list of other things that occurred and then schedule an event uh, where you actually can bring people together in the future uh, and to go over things in more detail. Uh, but again, objective records are very helpful um, and uh, the ability to at least, uh, if you are going to delay a debriefing, to at least cover one or two very important aspects of that, I think uh, become critical in maintaining people's interest and helping them to, you know, hopefully if, if there are weaknesses, avoid those because the same thing could happen in the next hour or the next day. Um, and if, if there are particular strengths that become manifest, you want to be able to ha help them replicate those uh, in the immediate future also. Okay. And then along the same lines, ideally, how often should you debrief? After every event, after each new patient, how often do you debrief? I think in a perfect world, we're debriefing um, you know, all the time. Um, but I think because debriefing does take people away from care, it can be challenging. So the, um, clearly, the, the times when we debrief the most often, at least in healthcare, is after a mistake is made. Um, or after a critical event in which a patient um, patient status may have changed acutely. Um, but really, I would see debriefing and even the strategies that we use in debriefing aren't limited to only those discussions that we title as debriefings. I think a lot of these strategies can apply to just having conversations with one another about trying to uncover um, how we as a team could continue to perform well or, or improve our performance. So for example, something like um, avoiding qualitative statements and, and trying to minimize defensiveness. Sometimes when I'm talking to my colleagues, even in very short discussions about something that I did or something that we did as a team, I employ those strategies with the goal of really just trying to learn how to do better. Um, but I think as a starting point to that specific question specifically, um, I think, you know, after uh, an acute event when a patient status change changes is really the, the clear starting point, but then learning how to disseminate these strategies in discussions beyond that is really our goal. And another very important point is, uh, especially for those of you who are listening and are in healthcare, um, when you debrief a real life healthcare event, um, you want to first have some sort of policy or procedure in place as to how to do that. And I would recommend that you talk to the risk managers at your hospital or your clinic or your school um, to, go, to know how to go about that. And that's not to say that we want to practice defensive medicine and cover up our weaknesses by any means. Uh, if we determine that a weakness has become manifest and it has resulted in patient harm, then of course we're going to talk to that patient, we're going to talk to that patient's family about the significance of that. But what we want to be able to do during a debriefing is we want people to be able to speak freely. And if they feel that they are perhaps uh, placing themselves at uh, legal risk or their institution at legal risk, they may not speak freely and we may never uncover the root cause of a particular issue. 
And so it's really to protect the confidentiality of that group, get as much information, accurate information as possible out into that discussion, come up with what the root causes are for that event, and then develop solutions around those. And then of course, once that's determined, if, if we need to inform the patient, the patient's family that perhaps, yes, we were in error, uh, then we need to go ahead and do that. So again, talk to your legal team. Uh, it's not about practicing defensive medicine. It's actually about getting the best information out and then doing the right thing for the patient. Okay. Um, our next question here is, in a debrief setting, how would you approach a person who routinely cannot admit to or see that they've made a mistake? And how would you debrief colleagues who refuse formal or critical stress debriefing in a less formal but more helpful way for them? I think those are two separate questions. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the first one uh, is, regard is regarding just common challenges. Um, people who can't see their own weaknesses or perhaps refuse to see their own weaknesses or acknowledge them or clearly don't want to talk about them and kind of just lumping them all in that defensive category. Um, I think that situation in, is really a place where having an objective record can be very, very valuable. And that's why, especially um, in training uh, circumstances when, when the um, environment allows or you know, if there's an ability to set up video, that's video is your best friend as the debriefer in that situation because now you have a record where you don't have to get in a situation where the debriefers were counting what happened and perhaps that defensive person is arguing with what actually happened or what they said or did. Um, you can really just refer to the video, let everybody in the debriefing see that, and then just talk about it in a very objective manner. You know, what happened, um, the series of events, what were the circumstances that led to those different series of events, but then also um, being careful, I think, to avoid perhaps directing all of the questions specifically to that person, even though you as a debriefer may think that that person had the primary responsibility for that series of events, um, but asking the group as a whole to analyze the team's performance in that situation. Um, and then using strategies like we covered here where you're avoiding the second person, you're really inviting everybody to discuss um, their perceptions um, and their understanding of how the team performed in that particular situation. And th that's a common concern that yeah. uh, people won't want to talk about their errors and they'll be really defensive. Um, again, we've used video for a long time. I've been debriefing for over two decades now. And my experience with that is actually that's a fairly rare occurrence. Um, because the video, you really can't argue with it, it's there. Mm -hmm. And the vast majority of the time, even when people perform poorly, uh, they're more than willing to talk about it because it's there, everybody sees it, and they wanna find a way to avoid that in the future. So I haven't seen that to be a common problem at all, even though it gets talked about quite a bit within the healthcare debriefing community. And I'm sorry, there was a second part to the question also. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, how would you debrief colleagues who refuse formal critical stress debriefing in a less formal but still helpful way. Yeah, I think that those kinds of things, some, sometimes on a rare occasion that may actually occur during a debriefing itself, or the, you, it just becomes manifest that somebody's having a really difficult time and really can't participate. And so our strategies are to actually um, uh, send the rest of the group out for a quick break and then talk to that person one-on-one, -on -one, ask them if there's somebody that they can call, you can call to help them out, um, ask them if they can continue. Uh, you can't force anyone uh, to go see someone, uh, even though you think they may need help, but what you can do is you can be compassionate in your approach, recognize when they might need help, and offer that to them. Okay, thank you. All right, well, unfortunately, we're getting close to the hour, so we'll have to wrap up the Q&A session. Thank you very much, Dr. Halimek and Dr. Yamada for sharing your knowledge with our participants today. And for those of you who have indicated an interest in the program, our team will be reaching out with more information and you can always visit us at scpd.stanford.edu forward slash debriefing. As a final reminder, the recording of this webinar will be emailed to you within a week. And thank you all for joining us today. Have a great rest of your week.